I think we had a fairly successful walk uh, yeah. earlier, oh, those yeah. couple hours, got oh, to yeah. see a lot of diversity. I ended up counting 40, and then on the way over I saw Swainson's thrush, so 41, which I think is what uh, a couple of folks maybe saw in the cemetery earlier. But today is International or World uh, Migration Bird Day, uh, so that's why we're here today celebrating this. And this is a magnolia warbler, uh, one of the um, birds that are that should be moving through right now. Uh, one of my favorite warblers. So why do birds migrate? Uh, really, it comes down to uh, food and resources. So uh, a lot of birds, especially warblers, survive off of bugs, uh, fruit, um, but they're constantly in competition. Um, with each other, with other animals. Uh, there's limited resources, so uh, only certain times a year are there caterpillars or uh, moths. So it's specific to what the birds are actually eating, uh, there's only seasons of which they can actually get the food that they're looking for. Uh, so by moving constantly and only being in an area for a short amount of time, uh, they're able to stay on top of like new resources. So they're constantly flying around looking for food. Um, shelter is another big component to this too. So coming up right as the leaves are budding, uh, being in a warm climate constantly because they can't survive in the winter. This is a yellow warbler. Um, had a very brief look at one of these today, this morning. Uh, but they're more common around marshy areas, so anywhere there's water, you're going to see these guys, and they're going to be one of our most uh, common warblers that stay and breed in this area uh, in the summertime. So, um, but, so the paths that birds migrate, so we're right in the middle of a major flyway, so the Mississippi uh, flyway, so that actually um, is more concentrated in, along the Mississippi, as it sounds, uh, and also along uh, right towards Chicago. So those are the two best areas within our flyway, but we see, we're very lucky up here. Uh, I used to live in North Carolina the last five or six years, and migration wasn't very exciting, or there's very little migration, so you'd see a, a couple of one bird or a couple of another. But in the next week or so, you can see 20, 30 um, individuals of each species moving through. So along the rivers, that's going to be the most uh, common places that you're going to see. And the same goes for the fall, so what comes up must go down. Uh, so a lot of the birds are moving up to the boreal forest, especially in this example. And then you see kind of a, a large uh, confluence of birds that move through the Minnesota and Wisconsin region uh, on their way south. Some birds that fly up north or fly on their way north through this area actually do fly along the ocean or in the ocean, essentially. Uh, with a good north wind in the fall. So it's just kind of getting down south as quick as they can because they stay up there a little bit later. So once October comes, you know, it starts getting cold. You might be seeing some snow up in Canada. Uh, birds will try to get south as, as quickly as they can. Um, and primarily the neotropical birds. So what are neotropical birds? So the neotropical region is uh, Central and Latin America, the Caribbean islands, and then also uh, South America. So you're, you're seeing a, a wide diversity of plant life down there. And uh, when it's our winter up here, it's summer down there. So that's another important aspect is that uh, there's a lot of uh, food for them, there's shelter, so they join the, the species that are there year round. Um, you think of like the Amazon rainforest, or you think of some of these really beautiful places like Costa Rica. So in our winter time, there's a lot of diversity that's added to that area because the species that are up here join the species that are always down there at that time. But there's plenty of food. Um, 
So the, the term neotropical or a bird that's neotropical is going to be a bird that spends their winter time in Central, South Americas and the Caribbean islands. And then they'll fly up uh, into um, our region. So one example that we saw today is a rose-breasted grosbeak. So they winter in some of the southern Central American countries. And then it looks like uh, Colombia, Venezuela, and uh, parts of Peru and Ecuador. So they'll make the trip. Um, as of a couple weeks ago, they start to head up this way. And we're seeing good numbers of them already. Um, within the next week or two, you should see quite a few of these, these species around. They're a very common uh, breeder in our, in our range, in our area. Uh, likewise, the scarlet tanager. So they use some of the same wintering range. You can see down here, uh, Colombia and a little bit south, it uh, looks like Ecuador and Peru. Uh, they spend their winter down there, but then they spend the summertime breeding up uh, in our range and then also in the northeast as well. Uh, so they're pretty common. Uh, they're, I haven't seen any yet, but they should be arriving pretty soon. There are some of the more late breeders, which coincides with them being a little bit further south in their range. Um, and then kind of highlight a warbler, so specifically a Blackburnian warbler. So this is going to be a species that nests primarily in that boreal range. You can see kind of the um, north of the Great Lakes, but also they breed along the, in the Appalachians at high elevations. So you're talking like 4,000, 5,000 feet altitude. Uh, so They'll, they'll primarily be nesting in spruce trees, looking for spruce. They eat the spruce budworms that, um, that are prevalent in those, and that's what they mainly live off of. Uh, they're one of my favorite war warblers. I, I really enjoy seeing them. Um, they should be moving through as well uh, right around this time. Uh, so some great ways to kind of see when and where birds are going to be showing up is uh, bird migration is very weather dependent. So we're talking uh, south winds. So I took a screenshot of just a weather underground app. Uh, so this is showing that last night we had some really strong northern winds uh, starting at about five miles per hour. Then today uh, and through tonight we're going to see more migration. So tomorrow morning should also be a really good day. Uh, a lot of diversity added, a lot more species. Another website you can use is you can see kind of the, this is a windy.com. Uh, it'll show rain, it'll show where the winds are, um, low and high pressure systems. I really like to see that or watch that as well. Um, but it gives a really good indicator of when you're going to see birds or when you're going to see movement. And if you check the weather radar at night, you'll actually see what looks like rain is actually like millions of birds that are moving through the area. Uh, so you can, I know Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin usually posts that. Um, and then the Cornell Lab at University takes all this information uh, for the whole country and they actually put up this thing called a bird cast. So during the spring and fall migration periods, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology will actually have these heat maps of where the uh, most the most intense migration should be happening. So this is the cast for last night. So essentially from the 10th to the 11th, where should you be seeing the most movement? And this is very dependent on that weather. So you're seeing these areas where there's storms and rain kind of in the southern part of the country, but you're seeing these nice uh, southern winds in the Midwest and so that's that's what brought a lot of the birds up that we're seeing today um, and a lot some of them will be staying some are moving through and then uh, tonight I think the forecast is pretty similar uh, should as we're seeing with the wind should move through a lot more uh, species and diversity so really cool indicators I think technology has helped a lot for giving us the opportunity to kind of know what to expect and uh, where to expect it. So the orange is more in Minnesota than Wisconsin, which is <coughs> yellow here. So is that yeah. typical or 
does that vary where the orange can go back and forth left or right? Well, this is just intensity. So there are more uh, south winds or higher intense. So I think what we're seeing, the overnight wind was maybe five or six mile per hour from the south. But in Iowa, it's a lot more plains down there. So you're seeing more probably 10 to 15 mile per hour south winds. So you're seeing a lot more movement. And in southern Minnesota, where a lot of the ag areas are, it's very, like I have family down there and they, it's always windy down there. Like it seems like it's always 15 miles per hour winds. Um, oh yeah, turkey vulture right behind. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's just, just areas where it's windier, you're gonna see a lot more movement anyways. Um, and then in parts of the country where maybe there's a north wind or, um, not a south wind, you're not gonna see a lot of movement. And this changes every single night. And if you just search uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology Birdcast, you can find this really easily and it'll update constantly. So uh, kind of looking at ways we can help migratory birds. Uh, I know a lot of you talked about, you have bird feeders, uh, bird baths, that's really great. Uh, it's really important to keep those clean, like monthly cleaning those out, getting, especially in the summer when it gets a little humid and you get a little bit of mold growth in the bottom of them of the seed that has just kind of sat in there. Maybe it, it rains. Um, bird baths, really important to keep clean. Uh, window decals to prevent bird strikes on windows. Uh, that's a really important thing. So there's some really cool UV protect, uh, reflective decals you can put on the, Outside, if you look out here in the uh, main area here, they have kind of the ribbons set up, uh, cross ribbons on the windows to prevent birds uh, from thinking that they can fly through that area. Did you have a and question? I, well, I was sharing, there's another product by Crayola. It's called the Crayola Window Crayons. Oh, cool. It's a great art project. They're, you know, $4, $5 for yeah. a box of colors. You can just and, color on it. And, you know, versus the decals that are almost that for each decal. Yeah. So anyway, so it's great as well. And it's yeah. Great fun if kids want to draw or adults or whatever in the windows. So you can just wipe it off with exactly. water. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And there's also sprays that you can put on, like not non-toxic sprays that you can just wipe off okay. with a with a towel too. It's probably about the same price, I would okay. say. But you just coat the windows essentially. Oh, okay. so, so where does one get that at a bird store? Yeah, okay. that's where I've seen them. I haven't used it personally, but it's just been described to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I mean, the largest threats, I would say, to migratory birds would be um, corporate buildings. So you look at like the skyline, uh, especially places where lights are left on. So businesses like, you know, Best Buy or U.S. Bank or U.S. Bank Stadium where the lights are on, birds follow that and strike windows more frequently. And then cats actually take a lot of birds uh, especially migratory birds in the spring. So outdoor cats are, are uh, no good for that. Um, for birds that do a lot of feeding off of the ground, uh, worms, insects, uh, pesticides and herbicides are actually really harmful because killing their food but also ingestion of that can lead to prolonged uh, issues for them. Um, and then native uh, planting native shrubs and trees is a really great thing that you can do. So um, all the native, or a lot of the native plants and trees that are in this area are there for, the, for a reason. And the birds have kind of co-evolved with those plants to, uh, to help them out. And so actually this book is one of my favorites. So Planting Native to Attract Birds in Your Yard by Sharon Sorensen. I have this book and have learned a lot, uh, a lot of really great information on kind of what to plant for what you're looking for, but also like based on the area you're in. Um, it's a really great resource to, to kind of provide in that because there's so many different types of plants. Um, and I have a, a list here. The far right side is gonna be all hummingbird specific. So you see columbine down to cardinal flower, that's gonna be mainly uh, hummingbird attractors. And then the rest of them are gonna be, and this is just a very short list, but kind of a highlight 
uh, a few of the plants and trees and shrubs that I really um, have found to be the uh, reoccurring when I when I look into this sort of information. So these are plants that have either high diversity of bugs and insects that hang out with them, or they just flower and they're good for the the berry eaters, um, cedar waxwings and robins and thrushes. So really cool, and there's a lot of resources on, on the internet too. The University of Minnesota has some information. The University of Wisconsin has information. And then also for kind of learning more about the birds in the area, um, I don't remember specifically if you guys have, had asked me, um, yeah, which, which guides I'd recommend. I like Sibley. So, uh, Sibley seems to be kind of the gold standard right now as far as uh, field guides go. The far left book is going to be a large, uh, a larger book, both size and quantity of birds, and that's going to be all of North America. And what he actually did, uh, or what he actually does, is he separates out. He has two kind of side books, there's the western and the eastern, so uh, Mount, Rocky Mountains and west is going to be the western field guide, and then everything east of the Rocky Mountains will be the east. And I really like that book uh, with the rose-breasted grosbeak on it, because it's a little more specific to our area and what we are likely to see. And it's a little bit smaller, so it's a little easier to handle um, in reference. Uh, and then the e-guide, Sibley has an e-guide to birds of North America, so you can get this on a tablet, you can get it on a phone, uh, really easy to access and to look through all that information um, if you don't want to use a field guide or if you just want to use it on your book or on your phone instead of a book. And then as I referenced with the BirdCast, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has all sorts of different resources, so online information is as far as uh, allaboutbirds.com is Cornell's website as kind of a field guide, uh, but also eBird is their big project that they collect a lot of data and information from. So they um, have, it's a very big citizen science. Uh, I use eBird, so anytime I'm out looking, you know, whether I'm hiking or looking for birds, I'll submit that data to eBird, and they do a lot of really cool graphs and uh, heat maps as far as wh where and when birds are migrating. Um, I wanted to, I meant to include that in this, and I and I didn't, but they all they do it for many species where you can kind of see week by week where they are, and it has kind of a heat map where the, where they are in South America to all the way to midsummer when they're in. You know, Canada, Wisconsin, Minnesota, then kind of the reverse where they fly back down and seeing the distribution. And so eBird's a really great resource for getting information, uh, seeing data of where birds are and where you, when to, you can expect them. Um, so comprehensively, I think all of those um, would be my recommendations. Otherwise, that's all I've got. Um, any questions? That was really helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try to keep it short and sweet. You guys have <clears throat> been here a few hours. But this is one of the yellow rumps that we're seeing a lot of. We saw a lot today. <laughs> yeah, probably like 10 or 11 or so. Yeah. But, but yeah. I just wanted to mention something about chimney swift migrations mm -hmm. because they have, they're up here now, they haven't been here very long, but for many years nobody knew where they spent their winters. Oh, yeah. And then there was a couple out in California that was ban that were banding chimney swifts. Okay. And sometime after that, somebody was down in the Brazilian rainforest and uh -huh. natives down there were wearing necklaces with bird pants. Strung on them. Oh my they, goodness! From the numbers on the bands, they determined that those were chimney swifts that were wintering there. Huh? And what happened to the birds that were on their necklaces? <laughs> they got they got eaten. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> got eaten. <laughs> yeah, that happens. 
some of the birds you really enjoy seeing up here, you know, like puffins out on the East Coast or Northeast, there's countries that that's like their staple. If you go to Iceland or, you know, Greenland. So, yeah, Atlantic puffins. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I, I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a penguin egg story too that I can share with you. Yeah. That penguin eggs keep them sawdust for, all, for sand for a long, long time. And fertilized or unfertilized. Either way, there's a lot of fertilized. Uh, fertilized. But anyway, from the nest. But anyway, there was a, we went on a penguin trip with an expert this past Did? winter and we learned a lot about it. But anyway, so the whole their whole project started 35 years ago because I can't remember which Navy it was. They were harvesting all these penguin eggs in Argentina on the coast to put in the sand or sawdust or whatever it was so they could feed their, their navy for the whole next year. And then it's like, but they only have one egg a year, maybe two. Oh my so anyway, so yeah. Just, yeah. There's a lot of restrictions. Because I remember. Of reason, yeah. yeah. Because when explorers first started going down to Antarctica, there was some really mass um, penguin um, collecting that was happening right. and eventually I think in the early 1900s um, some national organization body just said no like no more exactly. doing that <clears throat> which is great I mean it's it's a very important to keep them you know in this good numbers five years ago because the yeah. they were they were park rangers at the time in this park in Argentina <clears throat> and they were coming with wheelbarrows and hauling up all these eggs in the wheelbarrow and there was nobody who they had to prove that there was a reason you had to pre protect these, and that's how uh, the research project got started by this guy yeah. I traveled with. So it was, yeah. Gotcha. Curious. Uh, I just read a book kind of on similar lines. It was, I don't know if it's called the Fowlerin or the Farallon Islands. Yeah, I've heard of, yeah, I don't know. It's a reserve yeah. now, but it used to be, it's a really difficult island to, to get to, but migrating birds just flock to the island where they used to and lay all these eggs, sea mm -hmm. eggs, all sorts of things. And eggers from California used to come and harvest those eggs to bring back to California because at the time there weren't enough chickens in California wow. to feed everybody. So they sold chicken eggs to the restaurants hmm. to bake with these seabird eggs and tell people that they were chicken eggs. Um, but really, they were just illegally harvesting these eggs off this island. It's so no good. Eggs did not taste good. Yeah. That's why they would bake with them instead of serving them as oh. just eggs that you eat. It tastes like fish. Yeah, I'm sure they're a lot bigger too. You can get more. Seabirds are a lot bigger than chickens. Yeah. Interesting. Can you speak at all about maybe you've already talked about this um, uh, the changing climate and what kind of change the, how is that affecting our migratory birds? That's a big, broad question, but. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is when, you know, it's May and it should be warming up and you have like a large snow event or something like that. So erratic, uh, unexpected uh, weather, inclement weather where, you know, birds are back that primarily eat insects or worms and there's a foot of snow on the ground and all the insects are dead. So those birds that maybe come a little bit too early, like we had a snowstorm in April, right? And there are some birds that came up that aren't usually here um, during the winter. And so I think uh, that's, that's a huge player in, um, in what outcome they have, whether they're successful, whether they survive. Um, you know, high, high heat temperatures where maybe there isn't enough, um, you know, I, I think it comes down to the food that they're looking for and the habitats being uh, altered because of the climate. So, so specifically for, you know, uh, birds that rely on fish, uh, in northern Minnesota, if all the walleye die because the water is too hot, um, which is happening in a lot of the lakes, so there isn't fish for those birds. But specifically for, I, I'd say in any level, whether it's an eagle or if it's a warbler, um, just having uh, food be available and having that taken away because of too hot, too cold, 
snow when there isn't supposed to be, too much rain that's flooding out habitats or nests. If you're looking at birds that nest on the ground. Um, so things generally happen in a really balanced way historically. So you have, you know, it's warm when it's supposed to be, it's cold when it's supposed to be. Uh, you don't have these large drought periods that, uh, that are happening more frequently. Uh, heavy rains, erratic snowfalls. I'd say adding up just all those things. It just, some birds can adapt, some can't. And I just heard recently on NPR, there's a hundred, not a hundred, there's a million species in, the, in North America, whether it's insects, birds, mammals that are on the brink of extinction in the foreseeable future. Which, yeah, on CBS this morning, there was some, the top guy at Time Magazine, I don't know which department, was mm -hmm. talking about that on their yeah. 6 o'clock show this morning. Yeah. Which happens over time. Um, I just remember learning in school that like 99.9% .9 of species that have ever lived are extinct now, like over history. So, I mean, extinction events do happen and there are changes. I just think we're seeing some really crazy quick changes that usually take, you know, thousands of years to happen that are happening in a hundred years or 50 years. So that's the, that's, it's harder to adapt when things happen that quickly. Whereas, you know, um, when a, a week difference from last year, like this year, I'd say, I, I think I heard it's just on average, it's been colder this year same time last year compared to the same time last year. So birds that are expecting it to not be, you know, freezing overnight um, for their food, you know, food availability, they're going to be the ones that are most affected by things like that moving forward. So, but not all birds migrate at the same time. So generally what they're doing is they show up when their food should be available and then other species, their their babies uh, hatch out right when you know a certain type of worm is uh, coming out of their eggs. You know, so it's like the timing has to be kind of perfect or close to perfect. And when the timing gets thrown off, I think that's when when you get these uh, larger issues happening. So it's really cool how nature kind of coexists with each other so that it helps each other out and really balanced out Boggles the mind. yeah yeah there's like trillions of interactions right. that are that are happening all over the place so it's Speaking cool of that, one more question mm -hmm. can you speak at all about the importance of having native plants and trees and bushes available yeah how that affects, how important is that to our native bird populations as opposed to planting more ornamental things or more yeah. So, so yeah, and that's that's a big issue is having like say yards that that aren't filled with some of these native plants. Yeah, I think you might have been out at that time, but um, yeah, it's very important to have native plants because the birds that are here, the mammals, the all of the animals that are around have grown and kind of co-evolved with the plants that are originally from here, whether it's native grasses. Uh, for seed eaters or native berry trees or cherries, fruit bearing trees or flowers. Um, some of the ornamentals that come over from, you know, the other side of the world, like the, you know, the birds that are coming through here don't know what that is and don't really, you know, have, they don't, they don't have any interest in eating that. So it's already kind of hard enough for them to find food, so having more native plants is super important. Yeah, yeah and I kind of threw up just a highlight list here of some of the native plants, but this book I really like called Planting Native to Attract Birds, and Attract Birds to Your Yard uh, covers a lot of different stuff, so depending on where you're living. Is, she, um, reg is it a regional focused book? Or? Yeah, so it, it it does break it down by region and yeah, growing and temperate zones and everything. Yeah, because you're seeing like a mockingbird here, which is going to be a little bit more south from Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, more of a southeast um, up sort of bird. Is there a native plant nursery in Osceola? 
and I've never been up there, but maybe, I mean, I know other places will have some, but and there are some specifically the nurseries in the area, I can't keep track of, but there's where, if you went up there, there might be one yeah. up. There is one in River Falls, and there is one in North where? Um It's called Kinnickinnick Natives, and it's just, uh, just outside of River Falls. It's smaller. Yeah. South on 29, and it's not south. It's north on 65, maybe. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. So, say so it's right again. Of Connecticut natives. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're it's growing in popularity, and this is something I'm really passionate about. I love, you know, being outside gardening and landscaping, and not only do you see more birds when you when you have more natives in your yard, you're seeing more butterflies, you're seeing more insects. There's just kind of a feel to it that you're, mm -hmm. there's just more abundance of life in your yard. It's not just, you know, a lawn and a couple trees, but to have a garden and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, great. There's a company up in Hudson called plantables.com. Mm. Okay. And they, they hire uh, uh, mentally people and they make uh, butterfly bombs out of clay which are impregnated with native plants hmm. and uh, all you gotta do is oh. throw them out wherever you want plants to come up that's cool in a window box or whatever that's I'm really a cool similar. i think it's a great project but i got some of those i crumbled them all up mixed them with dirt and threw them in a bigger area so that it doesn't all happen right in one spot <laughs> Did they come up? I don't know. I just put them out there. I just, this that oh. was about a month ago. So okay. we'll, I'm, of course they will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think. I so last year I got a nice uh, uh, sunflower got up about that high. And I did that with a different type that was a, a flat thing, and I got one zinnia. And I know they love you know the pollinators love zinnias mm -hmm. too. So, but anyway, I thought the ball maybe would have more seeds in it, and I know it does sunflowers. No. So. I just thought it was a good idea good because project. it gives employment for people who would, wouldn't be working otherwise. I agree, yeah. And the conscientiousness to a lot of people, too. Yeah. So. yeah, and seeds spread, so once it kind of breaks down, the wind will blow them around a little bit. But also they grow fairly quickly, native plants do, if you're in the right you know, zone for them, as long as it's the right type of soil and everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's cool. Cool project. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks for coming that was out. Great morning. Thank you. Yeah, we had good weather, which is yeah, always well, helps. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Why wasn't?